This is Ursula Le Guin. And in 1973, she blessed we, the reading public, with the best literary representation of the well-known, well-debated and well-critiqued philosophical conundrum, the trolley problem. For those of you who don't know, simply put, the trolley problem gets you to choose between saving one person and saving five, but it's a lot more complicated than this initial premise might suggest. It's hailed as a landmark thought experiment that forces us to examine our morals and our hypocrisies. But there are many problems with the trolley problem that make it ineffective in actually determining what a person would do in this kind of life or death situation. The main problem being its detached objectivity. The way it's conveyed is sterile and emotionless, and we are emotional animals. That's where Le Guin comes in. Her incredible short story, The Ones Who Walk Away From Omelas, reforms the rational practicality of the trolley problem into a gut-wrenching, heartbreaking, extremely discomforting scenario that speaks to us on an emotional gut level. Suddenly, the cool objectivity of the trolley problem becomes far more complex as we, the reader, are left to reckon with a very, very difficult ethical dilemma that forces us to reflect on our own decisions and privileges as a person living in a society. Now, Le Guin isn't the only person to complicate and emote the trolley problem, but I'd argue her depiction of this ethical dilemma is the most brilliant and effective and distressing Prepare yourselves. But before we get into all that, we need a little more detail. What exactly is the trolley problem? And is it really so flawed? Can an expertly crafted short story that speaks to our emotions rather than our problem-solving ability lead us to moral clarity? And in a world where we're crushed under the paradox of feeling compelled to action yet powerless to effect meaningful change when faced with a seemingly overwhelming number of global problems, what can Ursula Le Guin teach us about the power of simply walking away? But before we get lost in the weeds of moral philosophy, welcome. I'm Dr. Rosie Whitcomb, and this is Mousy the Magnificent, and we make videos on all kinds of unsettling literature, so please do subscribe if that's your jam. As always, a ginormous thank you to our patrons over on Patreon for supporting us in the making of our videos. If you have the urge, and the financial means of course, to sign up, there's a link in the description. And before we start, please be aware that this video includes a discussion of child abuse. With all that out of the way, let's begin with a question. What's the problem with the trolley problem? Imagine you're driving a runaway trolley, or a tram, or a train. You can't stop it. You see it hurtling towards five people who are unable to get out of the way in time. You're powerless to do anything, but then you see there's a diversion in the tracks. If you pull the lever in front of you, you can divert the trolley away from the five people, sparing their lives. But down the other track is one person who also won't be able to get out of the way in time. If you choose to pull the lever, you save five, but kill one. What do you do? Who do you save? This is the heart of the dilemma, and it's a difficult one to solve. Unless, of course, you're a demon. So I would dangle a sharp blade out the window to slice the neck of the guy on the other track as we smoosh our five main guys. So. Here we have the premise of the trolley problem, first developed by Philippa Foote in 1967, only a few years before Le Guin published Omelas. In essence, the trolley problem is a thought experiment that encourages you to reflect on utilitarianism versus deontologism. What do those words mean? Well, utilitarianism is the belief that through your actions, you should aim to do the most good to the most people. So a utilitarian thinker would pull that lever. Killing one person is obviously better than killing five, right? Easy. Not so, say the deontologists, who believe you should make a decision based on a set of principles that clearly delineate right from wrong, and not because of the projected consequences. So a deontologist might elect not to pull the lever, because in doing so, they're still taking action to kill someone. Just because it's only one person doesn't make it right. What about the life of that individual? How is it fair that they should die? What if it were you? And this is where the difficulty lies. We're forced to think through the consequences of an action and consider whether its moral value is determined solely by its outcome. So what do most people answer? Well, actually, when coming at the trolley problem in its simplest form, Foote found that most people chose to pull the lever, saving five people and killing one. But it's important to remember that there are many, many iterations of the trolley problem. Change the scenario even slightly and people respond very differently. If, for example, to save the five people, you yourself have to actively push one person onto the tracks to stop the trolley, does that change your answer? 
Well, yes, it probably does, according to research. In this iteration, most people choose to abstain from taking any action. This is super interesting, and Foote argued that it demonstrated the distinction between killing and letting die. The former is active, while the latter is passive. And this begs the question, are we only okay with doing bad things when we play a passive role? The trolley problem is difficult to resolve, but as Foote proved, people can and do resolve it. They choose, one way or the other. And herein lies the inherent problem with the trolley problem. It's too objective. Yes, there are iterations that make it more challenging and more emotionally engaging, but as one research paper put it, trolley problems are unrealistic and unlike anything people encounter in the real world. So examining people's responses to sacrificial dilemmas may provide only a partial view of how people tend to confront moral situations in their everyday lives. In other words, trolley problems tend to lack real emotional depth and value. People will often answer using their rational minds because they're coming at the situation from an objective and depersonalized perspective. There's a certain order to proceedings that keeps us in check, so to speak. And that's where Le Guin comes in and f**ks things right up. With a clamour of bells that set the swallows soaring, the festival of summer came to the city Omelas, bright towered by the sea. What a cracker of an opening line. The use of light here is so powerful. You can see the big blue sky open immediately. The summer sun, bells, birds, bright towered city, joyful sounds and sunlight reflected off the buildings, off the sea. Omelas is a breath of fresh air. It's a beautiful city. It's abundant. And we get a strong sense of this from the very first line. We've been dropped into a day of festivity and joy in a gorgeous, uplifting setting. Le Guin really sets the scene from the boats in the harbour that sparkled with flags and the old moss-grown gardens under avenues of trees to the miles of sunlit air and the great joyous clanging of the bells. Children are playing, workers are working, women are chatting and tending to their babies. It's idyllic. It's a city circled by snow-capped mountains, freshened by a breeze, not too warm, not too cold, but just right. And just enough to make the celebratory flags flutter. This is Utopia. So, here we are, looking out across this divine vista. And we're lucky enough, as readers, to have a tour guide to show us around. We join the narrator on an anthropological deep dive of sorts as they describe to us what they've learned about the citizens of Omelas. Joyous! How is one to tell about joy? How describe the citizens of Omelas? I do not know the rules and laws of their society, but I suspect that they were singularly few. This narrative perspective, paired with Le Guin's choice to set her story in a fantastical city, is really important. Firstly, it brings us right into the dialogue. We become part of a sort of back and forth question and answer in which the narrator converses with us directly, and we are seemingly given a hand in shaping this world. I fear that Omelas so far strikes some of you as goody-goody. Smiles, bells, parades, horses, blech. If so, please add an orgy. If an orgy would help, don't hesitate. So not only are we invested in the world building of Omelas, but we're complicit in it. We become emotionally and creatively invested in it. We're invited to imagine what our idea of utopia would be. And secondly, our potential cynicism towards this utopia is validated. The way the narrator relates to us forms a bond. They ensure we're not alienated, that we remain interested and invested in Omelas and its people. Though we're outsiders looking in, we, like the narrator, are connected to Omelas. We're simultaneously exploring and creating this city. And this city is, effectively, a blank slate. Omelas is not a city on Earth. The citizens are not human. We are, the narrator presumably is, but they are not. Our outsider status allows us to consider any moral and ethical complications that might arise, spoilers they do, without the import and weight of our understanding of the context of being a human on Earth. We can be simultaneously emotionally invested in Omelas and its people while engaging with them from a more objective outside perspective. And this position, we assume, plays a vital role in our comprehension of the story and its exceedingly dark underbelly. But we're not quite there yet. 
For now, let's concentrate on this idea of abundant joy that the narrator has tasked themselves with describing to us. What we learn early on is that Omelas isn't the Shire. Though this is a virtual utopia, the citizens of Omelas are not simple folk, not dulcet shepherds, noble savages, bland utopians. Though they do without monarchy and slavery, the stock exchange, the advertisement, the secret police and the bomb, they aren't simple hobbitses. They're complex and intelligent beings who have managed, unlike us humans, to master the impossible. They exist as a truly peaceful society that has no need for capitalism, inequality or warfare. From an anthropological perspective, they're a fascinating find. This is real joy. They have acquired a truly perfect existence. And what's more, they're not puritanical about it. This isn't constrictive, carefully regulated, prudish joy. There is sex in Omelas, for example. There's drug use, and even better, it's drug use that comes without any negative side effects. Users become privy to the inmost secrets of the universe, as well as exciting the pleasures of sex beyond all belief. And it is not habit forming. All the ecstasy and none of the nasty. In summation, here in Omelas, we discover a people enjoying a boundless and generous contentment. A magnanimous triumph felt not against some outer enemy, but in communion with the finest and fairest in the souls of all men everywhere, and the splendour of the world's summer. This is what swells the hearts of the people of Omelas, and the victory they celebrate is that of life. And they all lived happily ever after. The end. What? Oh, you're wondering what any of this has to do with the trolley problem. You're confused because I said that the ones who walk away from Omelas is, and I quote, gut-wrenching, heartbreaking, and extremely discomforting? Don't worry about it. Just enjoy the flags waving, the sun shining, the happy children playing in the streets. You can't? You know something devastating is waiting just around the corner? Okay. Time to let the curtain drop. Do you believe? The narrator asks. Do you accept the festival, the city, the joy? No? Then let me describe one more thing. In a basement, under one of the beautiful public buildings of Omelas, or perhaps in the cellar of one of its spacious private homes, there is a room. It has one locked door and no window. A little light seeps in dustily between the cracks in the boards, second-hand from a cobwebbed window somewhere across the cellar. In one corner of the little room, a couple of mops with stiff, clotted, foul-smelling heads stand near a rusty bucket. The floor is dirt, a little damp to the touch, as cellar dirt usually is. The room is about three paces long and two wide. A mere broom closet or disused tool room. In the room... A child is sitting. It could be a boy or a girl. It looks about six, but actually is nearly ten. It is feeble-minded. Perhaps it was born defective, or perhaps it has become imbecile through fear, malnutrition and neglect. It picks its nose and occasionally fumbles vaguely with its toes or genitals as it sits hunched in the corner farthest from the bucket and the two mops. It is afraid of the mops. It finds them horrible. It shuts its eyes, but it knows the mops are still standing there, and the door is locked, and nobody will come. The door is always locked, and nobody ever comes, except that sometimes the child has no understanding of time or interval. Sometimes the door rattles terribly and opens, and a person or several people are there. One of them may come and kick the child to make it stand up. The others never come close, but peer in at it with frightened, disgusted eyes. The food bowl and the water jug are hastily filled. The door is locked. The eyes disappear. The people at the door never say anything. But the child, who has not always lived in the tool room and can remember sunlight and its mother's voice, sometimes speaks. I will be good, it says. Please let me out. I will be good. 
they never answer. The child used to scream for help at night and cry a good deal, but now it only makes a kind of whining, yeah, yeah, and it speaks less and less often. It is so thin there are no calves to its legs. Its belly protrudes. It lives on a half bowl of cornmeal and grease a day. It is naked. Its buttocks and thighs are a mass of festered sores as it sits in its own excrement continually. The worst part of this devastating shift in gears, I think, is the knowledge that the child has not always lived in the tool room and can remember the sunlight and its mother's voice. This is never expanded upon, but it suggests some kind of ritualistic societal decision-making that led to the child being chosen for this fate, not unlike the kind of ritual that features in Shirley Jackson's short story, The Lottery, which you can learn more about in this video. I'll put a link in the description. Somehow, some way, this child has been chosen, taken from a life that was presumably good and regular, and then utterly destroyed. Was it a random decision? Do all citizens live in fear that one day their child might be sacrificed to the same cause? And what of the mother? How does she fit into this nightmare scenario? Knowing that this is the trade-off, that a child must suffer so everyone else can thrive, obliterates the utopian ideal we're presented with at the start of the story. But we might go even further. Are the citizens of Omelas really thriving at all? Even if you live and work and prosper in this beautiful, sun-soaked city with all its bounty, the potential of this horror happening to you dogs your every step, surely. Even if you can truly turn a blind eye to that child's suffering, can you ignore the fact that your own child might be next? It's really important to point out here that there is no option to remain innocent in all this. Everyone knows what's going on. Everyone is told the truth when they come of age. Everyone knows the mountains, the vista, the summer festival, the bright, sparkling, sunlit cityscape can only exist in this horrifying balance. For the city to thrive, a child must be tortured. So here we go, the trolley problem. One is sacrificed to spare the many. But in this scenario, that utilitarian perspective doesn't seem like a straightforward choice, does it? Le Guin makes us confront in unspeakable detail the trade-off. The one person, the one child, whose experience of the world is a living hell. The contrast between settings, the bright city and the tiny, filthy cellar is so striking. The child's deformities and disabilities and extreme suffering are starkly cast against the thriving citizens of Omelas. Le Guin takes the objective trolley problem thought experiment and paints it in vivid, violent colour that cannot fail to conjure in us some kind of emotion. We are forced to sit with that child in the cellar. We're made complicit in their suffering. And crucially, at the end of it all, this isn't technically a thought experiment where we get to make a choice. This is a story in which we are powerless to affect change. We may have felt like we had a say in the world building and the formation of this glorious city, but actually we're just along for the ride as the anthropologist cum narrator describes this alien city to us. But if we're powerless as readers, what about the people of Omelas? What options do they have when confronted with this ugly reality? Well, they could free the child, and many of them consider it, but they understand that to do so would ruin the lives of everyone else in the city. Young people, upon their first visit to the cellar beneath the streets, often go home in tears or in a tearless rage when they have seen the child and faced this terrible paradox. But they can take comfort in the fact that by being complicit in the torture of that one child, they're sparing countless others. In fact, they are extra compassionate to one another to make up for the fact that they are perpetrating abominable abuse. It is because of the child that they are so gentle with children, for example. Care, compassion and love issue directly from the knowledge of this torture. So maybe there's some good in this dynamic after all. The end. No? Not quite satisfied? Can't sleep at night knowing that this is what's going on in a vile cellar beneath the city, but also can't justifiably destroy the lives of everyone you know and love and everyone else and bring ruin upon the entire populace? There is one more option. There is one more thing to tell, and this is quite incredible. At times, one of the adolescent girls or boys who go to see the child does not go home to weep or rage. 
does not, in fact, go home at all. Sometimes also a man or woman much older falls silent for a day or two and then leaves home. These people go out into the street and walk down the street alone. They keep walking and walk straight out of the city of Omelas, through the beautiful gates. They keep walking across the farmlands of Omelas. Each one goes alone, youth or girl, man or woman. Night falls. The traveller must pass down village streets, between the houses with yellow-lit windows, and on out into the darkness of the fields. Each alone. They go west or north towards the mountains. They go on. They leave Omelas. They walk ahead into the darkness, and they do not come back. The place they go towards is a place even less imaginable to most of us than the city of happiness. I cannot describe it at all. It's possible that it does not exist. But they seem to know where they are going, the ones who walk away from Amalas. I think this is such a breathtaking, beautiful, powerful ending. Le Guin is demonstrating for us the power of abstention, effectively, of refusing to be complicit in something awful. And I think it's something worth remembering as we navigate our own lives, morals, and ethical dilemmas. Now, obviously, there are plenty of reasons why someone would choose not to walk away from Amalas. You've got a young family, and to take them out onto the road and into the mountains would risk starvation, hypothermia, abject poverty, etc, etc. Or maybe you're very elderly, or disabled, or you have no relatives to go and stay with and would end up living in a cave, I don't know. Or, more broadly speaking, perhaps the system that is Omelas is just so big and ingrained in society that you don't feel you have the power to leave. But for some, for whatever reason, walking away is a viable option. And there is power in that form of quiet protest. Sometimes it's difficult to feel like we're doing enough to support all the causes we care about, all the people we care about, and this can lead to feelings of guilt and anger. Why aren't I on the front line fighting? Why am I not leading the charge in this cause I care about passionately? But sometimes it's not what we do, but what we choose not to do that can have the biggest long-term impact. Like, you don't have a lot of money to donate to charity, say, but you can choose where to spend, and importantly, where not to spend the money you do have, for example. I think what Le Guin does in this short story is incredibly impactful. Not only does she give the trolley problem an almost unbearable emotional weight, but she removes our ability to choose. We're just along for the incredibly uncomfortable ride, which then makes us reflect on our own morals and our own hypocrisies. How do we react to horrendous situations, like the current Palestinian genocide, for example? From our place within the system, can we recognise our own culpability and our ability to encourage change, even in a small way? Sean has made a really informative deep dive on this topic, which actually includes a segment on Omelas, so do check that out if you haven't already. So, to return to the questions we discussed at the beginning of the video. Does Le Guin provide us with a route to moral clarity? I genuinely don't know. I mean, you could read Omelas as a critique of utilitarianism, but I'm not sure Le Guin is necessarily advocating for something else, like deontology. It's also not 100% clear to me that walking away is framed as the right thing to do. What I think the story is doing is encouraging reflection and engagement. It's telling you something like, you can no longer stick your head in the sand. Here are the facts. Your move. And one move you can make is to remove yourself from a system that causes harm. Maybe you can't upend the system from the inside, but by abstaining from it, by walking away, perhaps something will start to shift. I would really love to know what you think about this story. What would you do? Choose to save the people? Choose to save the child? Walk away? Or maybe there's a secret option four I'm missing? Please let me know in the comments below. If you love ethical dilemmas like this one and fancy working through some more complicated feelings, watch our video on why censorship doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing by clicking here next.